I think the first thing to say is that we met our targets, which is always good news for a government department. I mean, uh, viewers may or may not know that the Treasury sets us some pretty demanding export targets to meet per sector per year, and we're well on track for doing that. Thanks in large part to our traditional markets of Hong Kong, Macau, uh, and uh, Dubai, and the rest of the UAE. Um, so that's a, that's a good start. I think what's also encouraging is the fact that we're growing the database of Experience UK uh, quickly and well. Um, my ambition is to try to capture as many people who are in the Experience economy, whether they know it or not, as part of the family and friends that Experience UK has become. Very much so. Uh, the, the term the experience economy is only known really by a narrow band of people, those people who have actually read the book, The Experience Economy. And to some extent we've been rather lazy and, and called ourselves the experience economy team for want of a better descriptor for the sector essentially. I mean it isn't a sector, it's a bunch of, of disciplines that come together in that sector. But we had to call it something. Um, and it's essentially the world of visitor attractions and museums and aquaria and zoos and increasingly retail. And we find a surprising number of people who should be in that sector, who don't recognize it as something they do. I'm thinking, for instance, of a, an audiovisual company who could be working on a hospital or a, an office building, but actually should also be or could also be in a theater or a museum or, or a theme park. And just because their mainstream work may not look like it belongs in the world of Mickey Mouse, there's still an application for them in our, in our world. The, the raison d'etre for um, the Department for International Trade is, is to connect supply and demand. Uh, what we have got is representation in over 100 countries around the world, people whose job it is to find business for Experience UK members and, and other British companies, of course. Um, they are pretty adept at doing so. Um, certainly in our target markets, which would be um, Hong Kong, China, the UAE and the USA, they are particularly tuned to the creative industries where we belong. Um, and as a result of that are, are very good at identifying opportunities for UK companies. And the whole point of setting up Experience UK is to create a demand side that those people can quickly identify. So if someone in Hong Kong wants an aquarium, uh, with, a, with a few clicks of a mouse, you can probably find half a dozen UK companies who can supply those aquarium needs. UK creativity is recognised all across the world. I don't think it's as recognised as it could be. Um, it creates a phenomenal amount of wealth for the UK. Um, often in the kind of, if you like, more glamorous worlds of film and music, which are very obviously creative driven. But in our particular part of that creative industry, uh, I think it's extremely well regarded by those people who found it. And part of the struggle that we have is to get that oxygen of publicity, to get that awareness out there. And, and one of the great aspirations I've got for Experience UK over the next few years is to play a, a bigger role and a wider role in getting that ability uh, known around the world. We have phenomenal products and services to offer, but I think perhaps being British we hide our lights under a bushel a little bit. Perhaps we, we, we don't boast as much as we probably should. Um, our, our big competitors are clearly the USA, who, who invented this stuff by and large. Um, but I think our creativity and our ability to offer imaginative and culturally, sen culturally sensitive solutions to buyers' needs is as good as, if not probably better, than that which comes out of the US. Um, and in terms of quality, uh, we are second to none. In terms of our, our storytelling and creativity, we are second to none. I absolutely believe in this sector and our capability. In terms of sector, I think the retail world is one that we want to take a really close look at in 2018. Um, it's increasingly obvious that with the rise of internet shopping, malls and, and fixed structure retail has a problem in competing with that. But what it can offer, which the internet can't, is an experience. Um, we, we've seen this over the years with people like Starbucks pioneering the, the experiential side of buying a cup of coffee, which you know, may sound a bit crass to us now. But retail malls and stores are increasingly looking at delivering a customer experience rather than a pure transaction. And that's the whole kind of Joe Pine ethos of the experience economy. That's what it's all about. And I think that we uh, have not been quick 
uh, to realize those links internally here. We have a retail team who are working to get UK stores into international markets. Um, what we need to do is connect better uh, with the destinations of those stores and our ability to, to deliver experiential um, elements to those potential clients, to those developers. So for instance, um, earlier this month we took a, a team of, of UK experience providers to MAPIC, uh, one of the big trade shows uh, in the retail industry uh, in Cannes, um, and that offers substantial opportunities. And in terms of markets, uh, I think Saudi Arabia fairly obviously is starting to get on people's radar and we're planning to take a group of experience-based companies to Saudi Arabia early in 2018. Um, I know Saudi Arabia's had a few false dawns before now, but I th the feeling is at this time it's real and this time there is a determination on the part of the Saudis to create an infrastructure which is more sympathetic to um, entertainment in a, in a very broad sense and um, and the shopping malls that are growing up around these new resorts will be a, a fantastic opportunity for us, I think. It's, it's absolutely an industry trend. Um, and, uh, and I saw something in the, in the paper just this morning that um, a number of stores are actually realizing that half the world's population is female and that uh, they need to actually start to become more female friendly in the way they lay out their stores, the things they provide in store, the atmosphere in store sometimes. Um, and that's a whole new area for us to maybe think about. And, and one of the things on my agenda next year is to start to, to think about the future more. We tend to be a bit reactive. Um, opportunity in country X, let's investigate it. We, we haven't had really the luxury of being able to think, okay, what's going to happen in the next five years? Um, take a, a, a market like Hong Kong, for instance. Very well established, very UK friendly. Um, a whole series of infrastructure projects in our world is happening at the moment. It's, it's proving a very fruitful ground for us. But what's Hong Kong going to look like in 10 years' time? What's Hong Kong going to want? What are consumers who go there going to want? What's the hotel of the future going to look like? Um, what's the shopping mall of the future going to look like? Um, and to be part of some sort of thought leadership process, I think, is a, a role that we can usefully play and then feed that intelligence, obviously, to our, to our client companies.